Welcome to this introduction to molecular dynamic simulation. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology, and I will try to introduce you to the main principle behind molecular dynamic simulation. I think the first question that we have to ask ourselves is why we perform molecular dynamic simulation. I think the main reason is that we cannot see atom. It's very hard to have an idea where ions are located, for example, in an ion channel, to have a picture of exactly where the membrane here, how the atom move, and how the protein itself move. Also, we have to think about that everything that we know on a molecular structure is actually a model. It's maybe not always we can have experimental information on the structure. Some molecules cannot be crystallized, some molecules are not soluble, and uh, some other molecules are very small, so also the contrast for prior ion is very hard. Like that if we want to know more about the dynamics or the energetic, energetic of such an ion channel, it's very hard experimentally. Really, in reality, atoms move. So I think in this case, if you want to investigate an ion channel, how it works in, in a, inside the membrane with the correct ion environment and other small molecule environment, one of the best options is to use molecular simulation. Molecular simulation is not only allowed us to visualize what happens, how the atoms move, but also allowed us to have an idea how molecules interact with each other. We can extract the information of binding affinity, as you will see later in this school. We will also see how the molecule change upon binding, so how we mimic and we try to promote process, interaction process between molecules. In general, when we are performing a simulation, the first step is that we have to simplify our problem. For example, we, we were asked to understand better a brain injury. So brain injury was, uh, is come from a, a mechanical insult. So that is the macroscopic, what happens at the microscopic level. This will cause an injury at the cellular level and the axon level. But we want to understand exactly what happens inside this cell. We cannot simulate the old cell. We don't have the information of all the molecules that are inside the cell. But we want to start to see what happens to the subcomponent of this cell membrane. What happens to the axonal membrane when it's under stress? Will it broken? Or which strain will be broken? Will it be form a pore? Or which strain will not? Of course, then this is a non-local event that we can perform with this molecular description. And we need the molecular description to perform properly. But we also then need to put this local deformation inside a large contrast of the cell. Deformation may occur in a different way along, for example, the axon. And for this problem, so we have simplified our description, we have to combine the results of this system with uh, other technique that allowed us to account for the rest of the cellular environment, so in a sort of multi-scale approach. So in this case specific, we will combine molecular dynamics results with fine element description of an axonal model. So what is the main goal of a molecular simulation? I will say that the molecular simulation in general, its main goal is to generate a ZAF representative conformation of the molecular system, such a way that we can extract a property. One of the approach we have its molecular dynamics that allowed us Molecular dynamic is based on the Newton equation. And uh, so what tell us the Newton equation? Actually, the Newton equation is uh, a relation between the acceleration that is acting on one atom and the force acting on the atom and the mass acting on the atom. We can speak about atom because here I have an atomistic representation, but we can speak a general on a particle. So from the, we are, can obtain the acceleration on a particle if we know the force on that particle 
and the mass of the particle. This is a second order differential equation. It can be solved in an analytical way. So what usually we do, we have a step, we use a time, a step in time. So we move from one conformation where for each particle we know the position and the velocity. We integrate the Newton equation and we get a following position and the following velocity for all the atoms. So the simulation proceeds in a very small step. Those steps are usually for an atomistic model in the order of femtoseconds. When, and these also reflect in a very, very small step in the movement of the molecule. And the molecules so move in a small step that very small compared to actually the human step. To apply the Newton equation, we need the information. is the force acting on the atoms. The mass, usually, we know. And the force is related to the potential that define all the interaction inside our system. And indeed, the potential is defined as V, is a function of the position of all the atoms. Uh, we can let our system move in a discrete step. So we have information at different time point. How we calculate the property. So in molecular dynamic simulation, we can take the average over the time, and that will provide an average value of the property that we are interested to calculate. And that is valid if we have sample, we have enough conformation of our system that are generated in time. But what happens in a mac on a macroscopic level, when usually we take, we, we do an association, an experiment that we experimentally measure a property, this property is the average over a large number of molecules. Usually in a curvette, uh, and when we perform experiment, we speak about millimolar, so it's something in the order of 10 of a power, more than power 20 molecules. And also, this property probably is the average of the time that the measurement took. So it's an average, a large number of molecules, and an average of the, the measurement time. So how we can compare those two average? We, we can compare them, so, and that is thanks to statistical mechanics, in particular theory developed uh, by Boltzmann and Gibbs. And here we come the ergodic hypothesis that states that the average of an ensemble so a large amount of conformation is equal to the average in time. So if we have sample long enough, our simulation, we can calculate the average, and this average is equal to the sample average. But we have to be sure that we have a sample enough conformation, such a way that our ensemble is ergodic and that this, the average value is comparable to an ensemble average. In doing that, we have to pay attention that not, uh, since we, if we were simulating, sorry, if we were simulating an infinity of time, then we will be sure that we all are converging. But since we cannot uh, simulate in, at infinity of time, we have to assume that, uh, that we simulate enough time that the property is converged. In doing that, we have to be aware that different property has different range time in which they achieve convergence. Another aspect that we have to consider from simulation is that we can, uh, we can extract equilibrium property from a simulation, but since we anyway generate a conformation in time, that allowed us also to start to extract time-dependent uh, property. So with time dependent, I can mean, I mean property like diffusion or property or kinetic property. So as I mentioned, there is a key factor in simulation, the time. We have always to simulate long enough to generate enough conformation that are representative for our 
a representative for our system. So, and there is a strict relation between the dimension of the system and how long we are, can simulate. So small system, we can simulate longer and longer for more things than a simple system than a complex system. So here I just put a feeling, of course we want to simulate and to get results usually in a reasonable time, and we have always to consider this. Understanding a small uh, movement of a small molecule, for example, we might want to have one microseconds a day, it is nowadays possible for small molecule, but if we want to go a step further to understand and predict the motion, then we will need a longer time. We will need that events repeat more than one time, and we might be to consider also better the environment, so the complexity of the system become larger, and then also the system become larger, and that means that the simulation time increases. So more the system increases, more we need to answer to our question longer time. Here I report the time that we wish, one if we want for a small molecule at a one microseconds per day, that means that as a whole time we need to have 400 microseconds each step. So we want to have each step in 400 microseconds. You have to read this slide in this way. Okay, so now we have seen the base, the principle behind molecular simulation, how we can extract property from molecular simulation. And now we can see what government and simulation. There are different, I will divide this in a three part. There is the choice of the molecular model that will govern your MD. There is the choice of the molecular condition. And also there is the choice that you make when you set the system, the environment of the system, where you set your system. We start uh, with uh, the choice, the molecular model. So we have different aspects here. We have to choose the degree of freedom that we want to use in our system we probably want to use which type of potential we use to describe the interaction between our particle in the system. So, the first, the degree of freedom. We can describe our system at a domestic level, that means one particle is one atom, but we could also decide to describe our system using one particle corresponding to a group of atoms. That is called also at a cross-grain level. In some case, we have a relation between the cross-grain definition of the bit and the atomistic description. So that means that we, knowing the position of the bit, we can back map the position of the atom, respect the position of the bit. This relation is peculiar for some cross-grain models, but not for all for cross-grain models. What is clear that when we decide between a degree of uh, between a cross-grain or an atomistic model, we also decide to for an atomistic model we have more particles, so our time, whatever simulation time, maybe we might need more time to simulate our system. In the cross grain model, we have a less number of particles, so that maybe the simulation is somehow it takes less time for the same simulation time, but uh, we reduce the degree of freedom and so we reduce also details. How to choose which type of description? So, in the, the, the when we, I mean, decide the description, we have to decide the degree of freedom, so which particle we will use to describe our system, and also which energy function we will use to describe the interaction between the particle in our system. How we make this choice? Probably we will make this choice based on these three criteria. The model that you will use should encompass the property of interest. 
these are all what we use in molecular simulation or an empirical model. So you have to be sure that it's appropriate to describe what you want, or the property that you want. The other things that you have to think about that uh, the simulation time that you can achieve with that model, with that description of the system, should be larger than the time scale of the process that you want to investigate. That is the second important point. And the third point, that the dimension that you, that you can describe with that molecular model should be larger of the size of the system that you want to simulate. If you can see, if we move from different level of description, starting from a quantum chemistry based description to an atomistic description, the cost grain description, some people will say that an atomistic description is already a cost grain description of a quantum chemistry description. When we move from quantum chemistry description to cost grain, we see that we have a change in the dimension of the system that we can simulate and the, the time, the simulation time that we can achieve. When we have choose our model, also there is another aspect. We can also decide to build, to, the f to construct our model. And in doing that, and also what people who have done before, one has to think about very basic things that a simplified representation of a molecular system, system should be as simple as possible. That is a very important. I will let you think about why, or if you are curious, you can have a look to the Nobel lecture of uh, Michael Levitt, Martin Campos, Michael Levitt, and Ariel Wershow got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2013. And I think their lectures are very nice to follow. So the potential energy here can be seen depending on different uh, of the position, depends on the position of the all the atom of the system, or all the particles of the system, and can be divided, factorized in the same way, in this way, in one body term, two body term, three body term four, five, and body term. Usually, more we increase the body term, more costly is the calculation. And also, high level body term are usually have a minor contribution, so they we can ignore. So usually in molecular simulation, we ignore everything that is, uh, we take in account up to three body term, but uh, in some particular way, in the sense that we base all our potential, our base pair potential. So we approximate the potential in, uh, in uh, one body that usually we ignore, and in two body potential, but we include in this two body potential the average effect of the three body potential. That means that that is the reason why our the potential that we are using in molecular simulation is an effective potential. What is the consequence of this approximation? That uh, our effective potential depends on somehow on the density, on the temperature of other factor, and it is not a true two-body potential. So which are the components of uh, this potential? Are all pair based on pair interaction? We have seen, but which are the components? So usually potentials are defined in different type of interaction and to see the interaction we can have a quick look uh, to how the movement that we will have in a molecule. So we have a vibration of the bond, we have a sort of a vibration of the angle and we have the rotation of the torsion. Plus we have all the non-bonded interaction that avoid that the molecule penetrate to each other, but also account how the molecules interact with each other. They like each other, they don't, they repel each other. So norm classically we divide the potential, so if we think about in terms that are 
bonded term where we include bond, angle, torsion and non-bonded term where we include Lena Jones interaction and electrostatic interaction. So this is a schematic representation of the molecular mechanics force field and you can see that is uh, the force field can be defined with uh, is a set given set of particle and force field is the potential function describe the interatomic interaction between all those particles. Force field are characterized by having a functional form and a set of parameters. Here is an example, a general example of a, a force field and its analytical form functions. Not all the force field have the same analytical function. One has to check. This is just an example. And you can see that you have term for bonds, angle, torsion. And we always have a sum of all the contribution on it. And then we have a term for the non-bonded interaction. What we can say more on force field? So usually force field are based on atom types. That means uh, that uh, those atom signs may be more than the normal number of, of elements. For example, for the oxygen in water, we might have one atom type, and for the oxygen in a carboxyl group, we will have a different atom type, even if they are both of the, the same atom type, atom element, the same, they are both uh, oxygen. All the parameter that are generated in a force field depends on the functional form that are, is used in that force field. That means that you cannot use a parameter for a bond interaction with another functional form. There is a strict link between the functional form and the parameters. Another thing is that if a parameter is de developed inside a force field, it cannot be used in another force field. So when you want to add a new parameter in the force field, you have to perform a parameterization in line with the philosophy, with the strategy of the force field. So these are four things to pay attention when one handles with force field. We have uh, in, in biophysical and biomolecular field, we have different force fields that are mainly used. And these are Amber, Chart, Promo, so PLS. Uh, speaking about coarse grain model and martini force field. We have also a series of, uh, here I list a series of uh, server online or offline tools that can help in parameterize new molecule for some of those force fields. But where I actually come from the parameter force that are in the force field, they can come from, from very different source, for this reason I will always say check how the force field that you decide to use has been parameterized. So they can, parameter can come from experimental data or they can also come from a initial study, in particular of a small molecule. Usually we, uh, they are, we use a small molecule that represent a functional group and we use that one to parameterize and then we hope that parameter developed for those molecules can be transferred to a larger the same functional group in a larger molecular context. We can have uh, information on angle and bonds, for example, for crystallographic crystal data. We can have uh, the constant, the bond and angle con force constant. They can come from here or Raman spectroscopy. Charge usually come from quantum mechanics calculation. But we have also different approach where we decide to parameterize, it is always usually we parameterize non-bonded interaction based on observed data like uh, thermodynamic or kinetic property and with a sort of fitting procedure <coughs> we try to reproduce those observable. That is frequently done for example in reproduce solvation free energy, partition property or kinetic uh, property like uh, water exchange for example. So in this way, a pool of parameters are be developed, and this, as I told before, is linked to the functional form. And 
and so it's linked to the force field within its parameter s. There's another aspect that is also linked when you choose a force field, you don't, don't only choose the, the, how to, the potential to describe uh, the interaction between our particles, but you also somehow make also choice of we, how we will treat for example, long-range interaction, because this is also how they are, you, you have to look how the parameters are parameterized in which environment. And also, you will also know already which type of time step that we will be in the future will be used and probably which type of bond constraint. These three aspects are also strictly linked to the choice of the force field. So we were saying, no bonded interaction, in particular, no bonded long range interaction. Why we are describing short range and long range no bonded interaction in different way? The reason is uh, that uh, more than 19% of the computational time is spent in uh, non calculating non bonded interaction. And the number of the non bonded interaction is increase with uh, the number of atoms square and that so that means that we always like to in decrease our computational time because we will need to sample longer so it was observed that both the function used uh, to describe the lena jones interaction and the electrostatic interaction so the interaction are decay they are relatively fast. Elena just the case of one over r a power six and Coulomb decay with one over r. That means that a longer at long range, the contribution of this interaction may be very small and that can be somehow ignored. So for this reason, we, we thought about to cut the potential at some point with a cutoff, and you will notice that uh, this each force field use different force field might use different cutoff and different way to treat how they switch between the cutoff and the long range interaction. And for this reason, it's very important when you run a simulation to account uh, to check how the long range interaction are defined in the force field parameterization. So we will say we cut, this can cause problem. We cannot ignore what is after the for after the cutoff, we have to consider it. So we use other methods. Some force field use a reaction field, other force field use partic particle meshing work to account for the interaction of long range. So we have seen the base idea behind molecular dynamic simulation. We see the molecular model, that is also what is part. And uh, here I want you a little to think about which you think are the challenge for molecular bio, biomolecular simulation. So I try to list the one that I think are the main three challenge. Maybe you think about other, but uh, so, Usually in biomolecular simulation, we want to reproduce biophysical process. Biophysical process involve hundreds of thousands of atoms, and those atoms have in intricate interaction that are difficult to simplify. And this, I think, is a big challenge. The other challenge that we have in biomolecular simulation is that we still want to reproduce biophysical process. And this biophysical process can span with a very large time scale. We have events very fast, like photosynthesis that occur in the range of picoseconds. We have enzymatic and regulatory process that might take in the order of milliseconds, and some structural organization might exceed seconds. And I think the third challenge is that uh, we have Actually, the force acting between the atom are very small force. A small driving force are really small driving force are the force ca causing the molecular change. 
in all this project we don't involve large change but very tiny change and these change results are results of large opposite energetic effect so it means that all the force field has to be tiny tuned such a way to describe this small driving force so these are the i think for me the big the three big challenge for molecular simulation maybe you have another other one and i will be happy to discuss with you in a Q&A.